Okay, I think we're going to get started. Um, apologies for the technical difficulties there. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, my name is uh, Thomas Gremion. I'm the Director of Food Policy at Consumer Federation of America. And this is our fifth installment of our virtual National Food Policy Conference series. Uh, thank you for participating. Uh, the Consumer Federation of America, for those of you who don't know, is a nonprofit consumer organization uh, that was established in 1968 to advance the consumer interest through research, education, and advocacy. Um, with this discussion series, we aim to continue in the tradition of our National Food Policy Conference by fostering an open, honest dialogue about food policy. Uh, the food policy topic under discussion today is meat without animals. It's a controversial topic, and the controversy extends to the very name that we use for these products. Um, the focus of today's discussion will be the practice of taking cells from a living animal, like a chicken or bluefin tuna, and growing them in a lab to create food. And call them what you will, clean meat or cell cultured meat or lab meat. Uh, the interest in these products reflects important concerns about the way we produce meat. Um, these concerns include environmental sustainability, animal welfare, labor conditions for the people that work in meat production, uh, zoonotic disease, and foodborne illness. However, as today's discussion will make clear, whether meat grown from cells, from, from cultured cells, uh, can help to address these problems in, in a meaningful way remains an open question. Our speakers today are some of the, the foremost experts on this topic, and I encourage you to take advantage of the occasion to ask questions and share your own perspectives in the chat function. Um, you can also go to our website and check out the bios for our speakers and, and their backgrounds. I think we'll be putting uh, some links to uh, the websites of their organizations in the, in the chat, oh, in, in the bio, uh, their biographies in the chat, chat box uh, today. So um, without further ado, I'd like to introduce our moderator. Um, you can check out his bios along with the other panelists uh, uh, on our website. Uh, he is uh, Tom Philpot the food and agriculture correspondent for Mother Jones Magazine and author of Perilous Bounty, The Looming Collapse of American Farming and How We Can Prevent It. Um, just a few weeks ago, Tom wrote an article entitled, Is Lab Meat About to Hit Your Dinner Plate? And in that article, he gives an overview of the latest developments in cell cultured meat technology and discloses some of his own skepticism of the industry and its uh, venture capitalist backers. And we'll no doubt get into the basis for that skepticism shortly. I know that Tom is going to lead us in a very uh, compelling discussion. So Tom, thank you for being here. Thank you, Thomas. And uh, thank you so much to the Consumer Federation of America for organizing this panel, for inviting me to moderate it. Um, and let me just start with um, brief introductions to the panelists, because um, I think we, we've got a, a really excellent panel here. Um, we've got um, Isha Datar, and why don't you uh, wave as I, as I introduce you. I mean, I guess your names are already on there, but we have Isha Datar, who I interviewed um, for my article. She's the executive director of New Harvest, a nonprofit organization dedicated to maximizing the positive impact of cell agriculture. Um, we also have Jim Thomas. He is the research director of the ETC group. And ETC or et cetera are a small international civil society collective that tracks emerging technologies. And I always sort of, um, they're kind of a go-to source for sort of figuring out what's next um, in sort of global food and ag tech and um, coming up with some of the the um, reasons to have concerns about these things. Um, we have uh, Jessica Almy. She's the uh, vice president of policy at the Good Food Institute, which is um, an organization. It's an international nonprofit that reimagines meat production and has been uh, very 
enthusiastic about cell-based meat. Um, and finally, we've got Tom Neltner. He is the chemicals policy director for the Environmental uh, Defense Fund, um, which is a great NGO that um, sort of tracks environmental issues that are going on. And, um, and so I just wanna frame this conversation I think, I think Thomas did a, a great job of talking about some of the um, you know, obvious problems with the industrial meat production system. Um, they were, you know, the, the labor issues of them were you know, absolutely laid bare by the COVID-19 pandemic when you know, the industry's power and sort of lobbying power allowed them to, to operate their plants in a way that essentially um, endanger the health of um, many thousands of workers by not allowing social distancing. And these plants became a, um, a vector of the spread of the virus in rural communities. And, you know, all of that just um, sort of seemed to me like this industry um, flexing its, its lobbying muscles. Um, but I think that, you know, right now, as we as we talk, we are seeing the impacts. We are we are seeing the sort of reality of climate chaos. We've got the West Coast. Much of the West Coast is on fire, um, in a way that's just becoming this annual, depressing and frightening. Right, um, I'm on the East Coast, where you know we're you know just beginning hurricane season. We just had a huge one hit the Gulf Coast, and we're at the very very beginning of the season. Um, uh, the, the, the Midwestern Corn Belt um, is also in a much less publicized drought right now. Um, you know, I think that we can all agree that the era of climate change being this thing to worry about in the future is over. It's here and it's, it's now. And I think meat production is at the center of it for two reasons. Uh, one is it's a massive emitter of greenhouse gases, especially methane and nitrous oxide. Um, and, you know, I think one reason why, I mean, I think we've, we've come to a point where there's pretty much of a consensus um, among people who study climate that this industry has to be reined in and, and sort of decreased in size. And, um, and, and one of the big reasons is emissions, but I also think that the industry is extremely fragile to climate change. And just one example of that is that the basis of U.S industrial meat production is the Corn Belt, uh, where you know, the upper Midwest centered in Iowa with a great bulk of corn and soybeans to go into the feed are produced. And um, there is a massive and very under, under publicized soil erosion crisis happening there. I've got a bunch of material about that in my book, but since my book came out, um, an amazing report that I just put uh, a link to in the chat by University of Massachusetts researchers, um, you know, basically we're using the tools of satellite imagery to figure out the erosion problem in the Corn Belt. And it is even worse than I thought. Um, I didn't get a chance, I couldn't get this into my book, but something like a third of the topsoil in the Corn Belt, which is one of the greatest food production centers in the world, this is incredible store of topsoil and about a third of it is of this precious resource is eroded away. So like it or not, um, you can sort of decide to eat less meat to emit, meth, uh, emit less methane, but um, no matter what, even if we um, don't respond to the climate crisis, and even if meat doesn't respond to the climate crisis, um, the climate crisis is coming for meat production. So we've got to figure out uh, some other way to, to do it. And, um, and that is where we get to um, lab-based meat. And so I wanted to um, start by um, a kind of a big framing question for this conversation. And, um, and you know, basically um, what role does cell meat or lab meat play in displacing this this sort of uh, industrial meat production that we have. Um, and so should private investors, you know, bent on saving the world, we have, you know, billionaires and, and socially conscious funds that want to invest, sort of do well by doing good and put 
money behind things that will improve the world. Should they put their money behind lab-based meat? Should the public sector, should you know, sort of um, USDA research money be going into lab-based meat and the sort of complicated process of replicating the biological product, the biological process of meat creation? This is a very difficult thing. Um, and does this idea make sense? Um, this is sort of, you know, creating an imitation of meat or a replication of meat. Uh, does it make sense as a strategy to displace um, meat, this sort of industrial model of meat production? Um, and, you know, some people have called for a moonshot for uh, cell-based meat, um, you know, sort of a marshalling of public resources behind this, um, this process of making a sort of perfect uh, analogy to a pork chop without, um, without a hog. Um, does this make sense as a strategy? And I, I want um, each of these panelists to, um, to have a chance to respond to this question and sort of put your cards out on the table of you know, where you stand on this as a strategy. And um, unless there are any objections, um, why don't we start with Jessica? Do, do you want to have a go at this um, at this question? Yes, and that's my answer. Yes, absolutely. This is <laughs> okay. a strategy that makes sense. You know, I think if you look at the literature on how people make food decisions, you see that despite the intentions they set for themselves and their families, they're overwhelmingly influenced by their food environment and by the options that are made available to them. And so if it's important to us that we um, protect the climate, address the looming crisis of antibiotic resistance, and feed a growing world population, we are going to need to give people choices that are, um, are, are lower impact. And it's important that those choices be as tasty and, and cheap and accessible as the choices they have now. So we have to make meat in a new way. And the entire premise of the Good Food Institute is that we need to use markets and innovation to create a sustainable, secure, and just food supply. Cultivated meat, that is meat cultivated from the cells of animals outside of the animal themselves, is a critical component of that strategy. People are not ready to give up meat. Most people are not ready to reduce the amount of meat they, they consume. And if we can make meat in a way that addresses the externalities, why should people give up meat? They should be able to enjoy their meat, um, but we need to address the impact that meat has. Cultivated meat is a, a brilliant and more, much more efficient solution than the current system. Um, Jim Thomas, how do you... How do you sort of think about this, this question? So my answer is no. Um, I, uh, I, I really think that the, um, you know, as, as an approach to dealing with, with our very real crises, our multiple crises that we're, fate, where we're approached, that we are dealing with, the, the idea that we're gonna you know, have a technological fix through a, through a better uh, chicken nugget um, is really, is, is really doesn't stack up um, and in fact is entirely in the wrong direction. Um, it's it's this is a, an approach that um, is about doubling down on the wrong food system, um, and you're absolutely right, Tom, when you say that you know the industrial food system actually all the way through, not just the the meat and livestock part of it, but in fact much of the industrial food system that we have to contend with is is it's dangerous, it's unjust, and it's rotten to the core, and it's controlled by uh, increasingly powerful and um, problematic uh, large corporations. None of that is addressed by by uh, by a moonshot attempt to trying to make a chicken protein in a, in a petri dish, um, and and in fact, you know, the the notion of moonshots themselves, I have a real problem with. You know, even the original moonshot um, didn't really um, address. It's, it's it's really a distraction approach to addressing the real serious problems that that people face everywhere around the world. But we have a very serious um, and um, uh, creative, connected movements that are working across all the many issues in our food change, the issues of human rights, as you were mentioning, the, the, the collapse, ecological collapse, we're facing not just pandemics and climate collapse and biodiversity collapse, but a very real rise of authoritarianism and so forth. And um, this is the wrong, the wrong approach. Okay. Um, and I just want to jump in and echo what Thomas said earlier about um, 
everyone should drop in questions into the chat as they come up. Don't don't hesitate to be provoked and in turn ask a provoking, uh, provocative question or, or respond um, in the chat. Um, let's go to Tom Neltner of the Environment, Environmental Defense Fund. What's, what's your perspective on this question? Yeah, we wanna help all emerging technologies that promise health and safety benefits that deal with sustainability, that provide the climate resilience to be out there. I don't think any one technology, we're not in the position of picking winners and losers in this one. We wanna make sure that they all get a fair hearing. What we have to be careful of is the bold promises that are made to make sure that they're documented. Oftentimes people are touting it as the solution to everything. And when we dig into it, we don't see that. So we wanna make sure in particular that it's safe. And that's a big concern of ours, but we also have to make sure that you know, it's actually going to meet the fulfill the promises of climate resilience. So consumers are actually making informed choices. Will this be the solution? I think it's going to be part of the solution down the line. When? I don't know. But I think we need to make sure that we keep an eye on it. We work it. We learn the lessons from the past on GMO or nanotechnology. And I think in some ways we are, but we've got to be careful of some of those warnings that uh, Jim raised. They're, they're legitimate and we need to be conscious of them, but we have to address all of these concerns as a society. Okay, and we're going to get to the regulatory question as well in a second, but um, Isha, what is your perspective on the sort of broad question of should we do cultured meat? Um, well, of course, I'm going to say yes, we should do cultured meat. I think there's a lot, uh, I think it is just such an incredibly promising technology that is so under understood. Um, and I think a lot of the benefits of cell cultured meat comes from displacing animal agriculture. And so that's not actually inherent to the technology itself. It actually is tied to whatever policy and everything that we create around the technology to make sure that it has the impact that it has. But one of the things that gets me most excited about cellular agriculture is the way that it allows us to re-envision land use on our earth. And you know, right now we dedicate 27% of land on this planet towards farming animals for food. And lots of estimates for producing meat and cell culture suggest that the land use that would be required to produce meat and cell culture would require 90% less, maybe 50% less if we're being less optimistic. Um, and that's kind of the first time we've seen a technology that really allows us to re-envision how we would want to use the land uh, give us an opportunity to rewild environments, restore that topsoil that you were talking about earlier. But none of that will happen unless there is appropriate policy that makes room for regenerative uh, agricultural systems, indigenous land management, all these kinds of other things. And so I don't want to say that cellular agriculture is in itself a technological fix, but I think it is so disruptive that it could spearhead systemic change. We just need to, to recognize that. So I think one way, um, I just think that the technology needs so much more than to just be subbed into our existing system. Um, we need to actually think about what it can enable and make room for that. I'm really interested in that answer. And I think um, maybe we can engage Jim because we've got um, a question sort of, uh, a couple of questions sort of prodding him to get more specific on his objections, but um, but I think that um, that a lot of times with a lot of novel technologies in the early phases of these technologies, we do hear a lot a lot of rhetoric about them being a sil silver bullet, about them allowing, you know, I think um, I was you know came into the GMO debate um, around two thousand five, and at that time there was still a lot of rhetoric about um, how it was going to sort of transform agri agriculture and make it um, be able to be sustainable and um, and because and and that that might have been possible I, I do think the technology was a little bit oversold in terms of how precise it was going to be and how much you could do with it um, but because we didn't change the context of agriculture we sort of subbed in and we know sort of you know, the, the status quo plus GM corn and soybeans, 
what we have now is none of us would want to walk around in the Corn Belt because there is likely dicamba wafting around in the air. Um, and, and so without um, making, you know, without doing other sorts of transformations and policy tweaks, um, that's what GMOs have sort of resolved to as we speak right now. Um, and, um, and so I, I think that's just a really important point and a sort of qualifier. And um, why don't I, I get, um, I think these remarks, I think are really relevant to what Jim was saying, or, you know, and also to get Jim to amplify some of his concerns and, and maybe get Jessica, you know, to talk a little bit about, do you think that there is a kind, of, kind of an overselling of, you know, take the current system, add, la you know, cultured meat, and everything's going to be fine. Um, do you see that as a simplification? Um, and, and, and how do you respond to it? So first, Jim, and then we'll go to Jessica. Yeah. Um, I, I think the thing I want to first begin by saying is that there's a there's kind of underlying theory of change that's being presented here. And Jessica actually put it forward as, um, you know, we let markets and innovation deal with uh, deal with the very complicated, naughty problems of our food system. Um, I think is is fundamentally flawed. Um, the the you know if it was as simple as because there is an alternative, you let it into the market and um, it will displace with as much marketing as you can. It will just displace um, the problematic thing, and the problematic thing will go away. You know then you know artificial sweetness for the last hundred years would have done that to the sugar industry, um, and certainly the food the livestock industry and and. Uh, industrial meat production is is far more powerful and, and embedded even than the sugar industry was. Um, it hasn't happened. It's not like that. It just became another niche, in fact, you know, within what became a sweetener industry. And we're seeing this already with the so-called alternatives to animal production is that big protein, the meat industry is becoming the protein industry, um, is happy to have these as yet another of several different niches that it will control. And, um, you know, that's why Tyson, Purdue, Maple Leaf, and so forth are, are in fact investing heavily into this. This is just one amongst many little niches that they will market um, and that they'll have available. And they'll have it available if there should be some crisis of production because of pandemics or because of climate change, um, but mostly they'll just blend it to extend their industrial production. So there's no, there's no disruption here. There's absolutely no disruption. It's a bit of a lie to say this is somehow disruptive. This is absolutely about propping up and giving new market opportunities to the same production system. Jessica, and, and then we'll go to Isha right after Jessica. So I, I agree that markets and innovation are not a solution to the problems of the food supply. What I'm suggesting is that they're a useful tool. Um, you know, I'm a realist and I, I recognize we live in this capitalist society and free markets are critically important to the United States and to many of our elected leaders and a lot of the people who vote for them. So this is the reality in which we find ourselves. And I think it's important to use markets and innovation rather than say public persuasion in order to address this issue because of the power that those, um, those have as a tool. Um, I don't think that cultivated meat is going to solve every problem we have. I think it is an important part of the solution when we're talking about the externalities of meat production. Um, the Good Food Institute advocates for cultivated meat, but we also advocate for plant-based meat and products of fermentation. You know, there are other technological platforms that I think could also be part of a really important solution. The issue really is whether people are going to willingly give up meat or reduce their meat and whether that's an outcome that we actually want if we can separate the consuming of the meat from the externalities that it has. And, and those have been very serious for the climate, um, for animal welfare and for human health. And I think that cultivated meat has a lot of promise because it does separate the meat itself, which everybody, well, not everybody, but certainly very, most of us enjoy eating. Many of us grew up eating, it's integral to our cultures. And I think to take a global perspective, it's important for um, nutrition, particularly in, in, in countries that are um, let more economically disadvantaged than the United States and Europe. Um, and so having that op opportunity available to us, I think is important. And so that's why I see a lot of promise in cultivated meat and why we're so enthusiastic about it as part of an alternative protein ecosystem. Isha? Um, I will just 
echo what Jim said about markets. You know, I think markets are an incredible social technology for solving some problems, but not all of them. And I think we have seen examples of markets failing to solve problems that could have easily be solved with other by other means that aren't related to technology. And so I always love to share the story of insulin, which we think about as technically the first cellular agriculture product used to come from pancreases, um, started to be made from in cell culture, just like uh, cell cultured food products. Um, what was it in 80, 1982, I think. And uh, 30 years later, uh, access to insulin is very low and we have you know, one in four Americans skipping doses of insulin due to price um, issues. And that's 30 years after scale up, after in tons of innovations, lots of IP, lots of everything. And only three companies uh, you know, control the supply of insulin really in the world. And so this is what I'm worried about happening with cellular agriculture is you know, my vision of a world where we can sell cultured meat is one that looks like, uh, you know, the small brewing industry where we have breweries all over the world making, you know, their own local meats, whatever that looks like, um, and not, you know, this uh, insulin paradigm. And I think that the the small brewery vision is possible, but it's going to take quite a lot of policy intervention, and it's going to take us also really thinking hard about what kind of IP and ownership needs to be put in place well before even I think the first company is out there um, making a profit. Um, so I, you know, I don't want to say markets altogether are a problem, but they they definitely need to be cultivated and pruned and controlled. And I'm a little bit worried that the speed of innovation and the speed of policymaking are are not conducive to that best case situation. Um, so I'm really happy we're having this conversation and I I at the end of the day, I am an optimist. I'm probably not a realist. Actually, I'm an optimist because I do think that this technology can be harnessed because we're in such a we're in such a period of need right now. Like the climate is changing and it is changing agriculture, whether we like it or not. And I, I see cellular agriculture as a, a ways for us to kind of perpetuate abundance in the face of, cellular, of in the face of climate change and um, it's going, I, I think we need to force ourselves to rethink a lot of things around it in order to get the most of it. Okay, I think this is a great segue into a question about regulation um, and how this stuff is gonna be regulated. Um, dropping um, this sort of um, incredible technological breakthrough of synthesizing insulin into the sort of profit-driven, um, you know, just in, in, you know, I think we can all agree insane US healthcare system didn't work out so well. Maybe the regulations could be tweaked um, to make insulin not something that people can, who need it can't afford. And, um, and so, you know, we're at a point where we're getting announcements like this quite often that, you know, for example, the famous San Francisco chef, Dominique Crin says she's gonna, she's gonna debut a cell-based chicken this year. So according to her, this is coming towards dinner plates, um, despite what I said in my article, um, it's gonna happen this year at a restaurant pending regulatory re review um, because the USDA and the FDA have not um, fully um, spelled out how they're gonna regulate it. None of these products are um, approved and so, Let's talk about how will it be regulated and how should it be regulated? Because there's been a lot of, of, of thought and writing about this recently. And why don't we start this one out with Tom, Tom N, that is. There's a lot of Toms here. Yes. Um, yeah, from EDS perspective, we're really concerned that companies first are not required to notify at FDA at all. They can self-certify it as safe and put it on the market. I'm hoping that most companies are smart enough not to do that because there's conflicts of interest loaded with that. But even when you do notify FDA, what we've been hearing from the agency and others is that the path they're choosing models what was done on genetically modified organisms instead of one that involves a rigorous review. And if you don't get that rigorous review up front, you aren't considering all of the consequences. And there's no public review of that. So while I can understand a company wanting to 
apply because FDA creates this option, we've called for FDA to set tight standards, but do its job and get these reviewed. That ask for a food additive petition, make the six month review and make a, a decision that the public can see that's not hidden behind um, FDA's review that do, isn't subject to public comment and isn't subject to challenge. That's the only way to have confidence that the food is indeed safe. So Tom, um, can was, you just, um, just jump in real quick and explain. So, um, so th there's this company that is called Upside Foods. It used to be called Memphis Meat. Um, one of the big players in the space. Um, and that's who this um, San Francisco chef is working with. And so when they say pending regulatory review, could they, could they literally have it on tables this year by just declaring the safe to the FDA or, or how, how is that process gonna work? And I know USDA has a role, which maybe someone can explain, um, is, it, is USDA's role just um, labeling? Um, but yeah, if you could just explain real quick um, how yeah, using this example of upside foods, like how is that going to work? Well, and Jessica and I had worked on this. Jessica, when you were back at uh, the Consumer uh, at Center for Science and the Public Interest, that FDA has interpreted the law to allow a company to self-certify something as generally recognized as safe and add it to food. That can happen on these products and there's nothing stopping them. FDA has said, please don't do that. We want to review it. And so they lower the standards by creating options that are more attractive for industry to get into the system. But yes, if you could self-certify it as grass, put it on the market and, and assume it's safe. There's problems with conflicts of interest. If it's your consultants that reviewed it and determined it's safe, there's problems there. And that's why we need that third party overview. But yes, Tom, that's what can happen. Now, one thing one hears and one digs into the um, sort of literature is putting it strong, but it's just sort of the, the, the hype around the industry is that, you know, basically this regulatory system is what's holding us back. And if we can only be more like Singapore, uh, where they've already, another company is, I think as we speak, um, selling um, lab-based chicken, um, then the industry would take off. Um, Jessica, why don't you give us your perspective on, on the regulation, thinking about the question, how should it work? How will it work? Um, but also, you know, take us through this, um, this upside foods example. And is there actually a chance that Dominic Crenn will be serving lab chicken in 2021? Yeah, so I think it's important to take a step back and recognize that we've got a pretty interesting food system, our food regulatory system here in the United States. I don't think that it's something that any of us would have designed if we were given carte blanche. And Tom and I have worked together on reforming parts of the, of the regulatory system that are out of whack and, and need to be corrected. Um, I'll just start by saying that um, we are hosting a virtual good food conference in a couple of weeks, and I'm moderating a panel on the regulatory issues. And we're bringing um, regulators from Singapore to come talk about the process there. We've got someone from USDA coming to talk about the U.S. process as well as a food lawyer to kind of guide us through it. So if this is an, a topic of interest, I'd encourage people to come to that session because we'll get into a lot more detail there. Um, but basically the, what has happened is the two agencies that are responsible for ensuring a safe and properly labeled food supply have decided to collaborate on regulatory oversight for cultivated meat. So for meat that comes from livestock and poultry species, um, how it's gonna work is that FDA will, will oversee the collection of cells, the storage and kind of the um, care of those cell lines and the growth of the cells and the cultivators. Um, and then at the point of harvest, which is an analogy to the harvest that happens in the slaughterhouse with traditional production, that authority will shift to USDA. And that agency will ensure that the meat is properly processed and that it's ultimately labeled in a way that is um, understood by consumers. And that's for the poultry and livestock species. For fish, FDA will retain that authority through the whole process. The two agencies have a formal agreement that spells out how they're working on this. They've developed three working groups that are focusing on specific areas where they need to coordinate and make sure that their approach is, is uh, collaborative and that they're sharing information with each other. So the idea that it somehow would come to market 
it without any kind of approval is, I think, leaves out some of those details. Now, the companies are in talks with FDA right now about the safety of their cells, you know, where they got the cells, how they're going to be growing those cells in the cultivator. And that's kind of where we are right now. There's also some open question around some of the labeling issues. And we expect that USDA is going to provide clarity on that. And FDA will have a harmonized approach. So there's, there are pieces of it that have left that are still being worked out because we don't have any products on the market in the United States today. But I think that the system that has been developed really plays to each of the agency strengths. FDA has um, you know, the ability to, they regulate cell culture, cult culturing and other parts of the FDA, you know, it's the Food and Drug Administration. So there's cell culturing that happens on the drug side already and they're, and they're comfortable with that. Um, they also, as Tom says, assess the safety of novel ingredients into the food supply and USDA really has expertise around the safe handling of meat because even though this is going to be produced in very clean facilities you know humans handling food products can introduce pathogens so it's important that it be handled safely and of course consumers need to understand what they're getting and the most important part of that is they need to understand if they have an allergy to red meat or if they have an allergy to seafood and they're buying these products, they're going to have that same allergic reaction. So the, the fair, safe and fair labeling of these products is also critically important that consumers understand they are actually meat and poultry and seafood. And if they have, you know, if there's a, if they have an allergy to one of those products, they can't safely consume these products. Hello. Um, I'm guessing just to really interject quickly about labeling. So one issue is that they, you know, cell-based chicken be labeled chicken, um, and maybe the meat industry doesn't want that. But will it, does the cell meat industry does it want its products to be labeled cell? So when the consumer goes into a grocery store and gets a chicken breast, um, and we'll get to the point, we'll get to the uh, question of whether there will be a chicken breast, but um, yeah, a cell-based chicken breast, but. When the consumer goes there, does the industry accept that it says whatever the phrase is, cultured or sell, or do you want to just have it say straight chicken? So that's a really interesting question. Um, Harvard Law School submitted a petition or a, something that was converted into a petition to the agencies around the labeling. And in that, they argue that meat production, as we as it exists today, is in many ways removed from what our grandparents would have recognized as meat production. And in each of those instances, the agencies have looked to see, or USDA has looked to see, is this materially the same product that consumers are buying, or is it different? And if it's materially the same, USDA has not required disclosures of those production processes on the label. So Harvard Law said, if this is materially the same, and that's a factual determination, no one can say that right now in the abstract, it depends on the particular product, right? But it could be in theory, then it shouldn't be required under existing law to be uh, labeled with disclosures. But no one in the industry has followed that train of thought. That's kind of a legal argument. Instead, the companies all want to differentiate their products from conventional products because that's their entire value proposition. This is produced differently. And when these products come to market, initially at least, they will be more expensive than other products in the supermarket or at the restaurant. And so consumers need to know that they've been produced through cultivating cells. The exact term that the industry should use and the, what the regulators are going to require, I think is an open question, but I think everybody agrees that it should be a neutral term. So it should be a term that is neither um, disparages cultivated meat, nor its competitors. It should instead be something that's descriptive about it. And I know that EDF has done some thinking on this, and there's been some um, really interesting consumer research that's beginning to, to look at what terms are used. I think the two most common used terms in the industry right now are cultivated and cell cultured. Okay. Isha. That's... I just wanted, I am not a regulatory or policy person, so I'm not going to comment too much on what that should look like, but I will just point out that one of the biggest problems with this idea in this field right now is that there is essentially no public sector. There is no third party that is going to generate data about safety right now. And so when, when we talk about the lack of data, it does make it seem like, though the companies are not putting it out there, but they have no incentive to, and they never would. And so maybe we need to be reframing this concept as 
the, the, reframing the idea of a moonshot um, instead, you know, we can't put people in a rocket and have the rocket explode. Like this is food safety and there is no going back if there is a safety issue at all. And so what we really need is that public support to generate the actual data so we are equipped to make the appropriate regulatory decisions and policy decisions. But right now there's just so much speculation on if it will do this, if it will pass this test, when actually those are just questions that could be answered if the you know, right safety experts and labs had access to independent funding. So independent funding labs or independently funded labs to test this are what's needed. So Jim, ETC Group has a lot to say about regulation and I'm sure you have a lot to say right now. So let's hear it. Yeah, and actually I was, I, I was just looking through the chat and there was an excellent comment actually by Michelle Simon. And if people don't know Michelle, she's the founder of the Plant-Based Foods Association and an excellent lawyer. And it's, it's, it's wonderful to see such wonderful people making comments on the side. And she said, the question about this, uh, Dominique uh, Karen, she said, you know, chefs don't understand politics. Um, actually, what I think is concerning here is, is, I don't know who Dominique Karen is. When I look her up, I find she's, a, she's an elite chef who has like a, a net worth of $75 million or something. Um, but, uh, you know, it's actually a, a chef is playing politics um, and not just a chef. Uh, very well-funded lobbyists are playing playing politics um, and by presenting this as something that we need to answer right now. Um, you know, if, if Dominique Krem's going to serve up a few chickens and it's not legal, well, don't do it. Like, we're not ready. It's, it's, it, does, it seems wrong to try and roll the agencies into making snap decisions. Um, and, and uh, around a technology that has so many questions and isn't even ready for prime time. It doesn't make any sense whatsoever. Um, and, and particularly then to, to devolve the discussion into which terrible set of um, regulatory approaches do we want to use? Um, I, I come from the UK um, and now live in Canada. Um, I'm familiar with certainly genetic engineering regulations in many, many countries. The, the, the regulations as they've evolved in the US around genetic engineering are literally the worst in the world. They're the least precautionary. They're the ones that have the least public in input. Notions like the, um, the, the grass, um, voluntary grass approach, it just, it would shock people in many parts of the world that, that a, a company can get away with that. So you're starting from such a back foot anyway. Um, and then to be rolled into, into setting the ground rules and governance uh, for, for something that hasn't, doesn't even really exist by a very wealthy chef in the Bay Area and you know, organizations with millions of dollars to lobby. Um, I, I just think, take a breath. There's, there's more important things that the US FDA, the USDA can be spending their time on to reorient our food system um, around agroecology, around reducing pesticides, about supporting farmers. This is, this is the wrong direction. All right. Um, now, so, here we are. So we discussed the, the regulatory um, issues and, and dilemmas, but how close is this stuff really? I, I just did a piece from Mother Jones called, uh, as Thomas was saying earlier, is lab meat about to hit your plate? And I found that there, you know, I would say the take, my takeaway from talking to a lot of people was there seems to be less here than, than we'd see I. And then when we get one of these announcements, like we're going to, we're gonna do lab meat um, on your plate um, this year or what's going on in Singapore. What we find is that a lot of the technological challenges um, of the industry aren't, haven't been solved, but a product is coming out. Um, and we know the way that, uh, that VC works, venture capital works that companies could take forever and ever um, and sort of burn through cash and put out products. Um, I don't think, um, that something like Uber um, has had, you know, billions of dollars worth of turnover and hasn't produced a profit yet. Um, and I think we're, you know, people in New York are saying that Uber prices have skyrocketed. Um, and so that transformative technology, um, you know, hasn't sorted out a lot of the labor problems and things that it, um, that it, it sort of promised to sort out from the beginning. Um, and as, you know, as we see burning through uh, venture capital um, money. So, you know, why don't we just get quick perspectives here? Because I do want to get to to questions uh, from the audience soon. But quick perspectives on how close is this stuff really? And I know that uh, when I say this stuff, I you know I could be I could mean some cells mixed mixed with some um, 
you know, breadcrumbs um, that cost a thousand dollars, but could be sold for 10 bucks uh, at a loss. Um, I, I don't mean that. I mean like commercially viable and ready to sort of do this uh, massive disruption that we, that we keep hearing about. Um, how close is that? And why don't we start with Isha? Um, I'm reminded Tom and I had a conversation about this for the article where he asked when this would be market viable in the market. And we, we talked about if we thought Tesla cars were currently um, on the market right now. Anyway, it was, it was an interesting parallel because it's actually a really tough question to gauge what we consider on the market. Um, Cause I think that we're gonna see a lot of rollouts with these high end shafts where you can exclusively eat something at a small restaurant or a tasting room. But seeing the kind of scale up that I think even we're seeing impossible and beyond meat achieve right now, I think is still a ways away because the cost is going to be high to produce this. We still have to build pilot plants. We still need to see what scale production looks like. But I think it's important for us to realize that this is this is one of the first times that BC funding is really fully in the food system. And so I do think we are going to see a lot of products on the market selling at a loss for a while. And I'm I'm a little bit curious, you know, how does that disrupt uh, the rest of what's going on in the grocery store? That, that's a bit of a concern of mine. Um, so I'm not going to answer your question, Tom, because I don't know when it will be on the market, but I think we will see these kind of slowly phasing in um, over a long period of time. And I think that what's going on with the regulatory conversation and the safety conversation is, is going to be a big piece of when we actually see it out there in the market in a big way. Um, why doesn't Jessica, if she would intervene and tell us? Sure. How close this stuff is. Well, my expertise is policy, so I don't have firsthand knowledge on this, but the Good Food Institute did commission a techno-economic analysis that showed that it can be cost comparative by 2030. And I'll share that link in the chat so if people want to look at that. That's about the extent of my expertise on that. What I will say, though, is it hasn't succeeded yet. And you know, when we started off talking about a moonshot, I think we really need one for this industry. We need open access research um, that is going to really propel it forward. I think there are technical challenges that remain. And I, you know, I think the comparable examples are the way that governments have been involved with renewables and electric vehicles. You know, for electric vehicles, for example, governments around the world have invested in R&D, infrastructure in terms of charging stations and incentives. And we need kind of similar policy framework for um, advancing cultivated meat. Tom. A few quick, are you there? Can you hear me? Yes, yeah. Okay, um, a, quick, a few quick ones. Um, uh, Isha, I was involved in making pancreatic insulin back in 1980s. I'm just showing why I earned all the gray hairs. But also in the same division was they were making it the Umulin products. Um, and you know, it took a few years to catch on, but those initial approvals set the precedent for everything else, which is why I think it's important that we get those regulatory approvals right. Jim. Uh-oh. Is Tom freezing for everyone else too? Yes. At all. Um, so that's important. Oh, and then I Tom, just have one other, oh, what's wrong? Oh. Um, we lost you there for a second, if you want to repeat your point. Oh, that oftentimes that first approval becomes the precedent for all the later approvals. Mm -hmm. That's why it's important to get this first one right. And mm -hmm. it, based on the trade journals, one company making a seafood has already awaiting regulatory approval. Now, that's trade journals. I don't know. I haven't seen anything, but I think that initial approvals that'll build the markets on the chef side will, is happening. I think getting it to the grocery store, which is I think the real test, it looks to be farther down the line. But in my experience working in chemical manu as a chemical manufacturing in fermentation operations, you can start scaling up these pretty quickly um, if you get a good stable brew. 
My understanding is that scaling up r remains a pretty big challenge. Um, and, um, and where are we? There's a lot of talk about replacing um, fetal bovine serum. Um, I think probably everyone, most people listening to this know about that stuff, but it's, um, it's a serum that, um, that leads to very efficient growth of, of cells. And it's really hard to get cells to grow without it. It's a, a, a slaughterhouse byproduct. And so if you're trying to eliminate um, animal production, you don't want to rely on something that basically sort of requires a giant um, life cycle industry. Um, and it's also extremely expensive uh, because it's mostly used for, um, I mean, it's literally the blood of um, cow fetuses. Um, and so it's you know, labor intensive to extract um, and it's mostly used for, for um, medical de uh, development um, in very small doses. Um, and so I think most people agree that we can't get um, to scale without replacing fetal bovine serum. And where are we realistically with that? We have some companies saying that they've done it. Um, is, that, is that true? And um, if it's gonna be so proprietary and patented if that one company is doing it, then how is that going to disrupt any, anything? Um, who wants to, you know, address the whole FBS question? Isha. Um, so last year we did a big safety initiative with 50 different companies who we asked to tell us about their uh, process of how they manufactured cell cultured meat so we could begin to map out what the safety concerns would be. And in that process, we learned that a lot of companies have moved away from using FBS already. But of course, we wouldn't have found that out if we didn't go through this whole rigmarole of asking all of them these kind of detailed questions about their process. And so I'm, I'm concerned about it because I don't think that's something that even falls into the realm of policy or regulatory. I think this is actually an opportunity for the industry to impress us by setting their own standard that they are never going to use this product. and. Um, and all and move away from it completely. But other, you know, in the absence of some kind of declaration like that, we are in a situation kind of similar to what's happening in the biomedical field right now, where there are replacements for FBS that exist, but they're highly proprietary, incredibly expensive. A lot of them still use animal products. They're just not that specific animal product. And to me, that's not necessarily the best, you know, that's like a step in a better direction, but like the smallest possible step. Um, so, you know, that's, I think that's a low hanging fruit in terms of the industry showing that they are actually committed to moving away from FBS, which is definitely a highly problematic kind of piece of the puzzle right now. And I think, in, oh yeah, okay, Jessica, go ahead. Yeah, I was gonna share that um, if you go to gfi.org, we have a snapshot from the end of 2020 where we survey companies about this and it goes through the methodology. Um, but basically one of the findings was that 16 companies plan to commercialize or license uh, cell culture media, which would not use FBS. And um, we also found that one third of the manufacturers expect the cost to be below a dollar a liter in the next 12 months. It's one of the primary expenses right now for these companies. So getting the cost down is important to being, you know, to kind of answer your previous question, to bringing these products to market um, at prices that consumers can afford. Um, and, but one of our scientists, uh, Vice President of Science and Technology, Dr. Liz Specht, had also done a previous um, estimate, which where she projected out how you would replace FBS in um, for culturing meat, and her projections found that it could go as low as 24 cents a liter. So I think there's tremendous promise with animal free um, media culture, culture media, which is really important for the commercial success of these products. And in addition, uh, many of the people who are, you know, behind these companies are ethically driven, um, and wouldn't want to have FBS in products that they brought to market. I was very struck by the um, just food launch in Singapore that the products still contain what the company says is a small amount of FBS and that the FBS free product is, is coming up next. Um, and you know, as a journalist who is generally suspicious of um, sort of VC pronouncements, um, 
you know, I, you know, I await with skepticism that it's, it's not going to be kind of a bait and switch kind of a deal. And, and maybe it won't be, maybe we are about to see, but uh, a bunch of uh, FBS uh, free products, but it just struck me that sort of the first one tasted, um, at, you know, for the general public still contain this stuff in, um, in 2021. Jim, you've got your hand up. And you're on mute. Uh, thank you. I mean, regardless of how much FBS, there's a lot of BS that's going to stay around. And okay. um, I, I, I think when, it's worth kind of zooming out and saying, you know, this this stuff isn't really scaling anytime soon. This this there's still major technical problems. Um, all of the claims that this is about addressing climate change or or so forth, frankly, don't add up um, against the scale of the problem when you zoom out and look at the food system. Um, and, and I actually think maybe there's a bigger picture to look at here. Um, this isn't the first time that cell cultures have been promised going to deliver everything. Back in the 1980s, we were told that cell cultures were going to give us vanilla and spices. And in fact, cell cultures were going to become the basis of a new production system. It didn't work. It didn't work actually because they couldn't scale it, just as I think scaling here is going to be a major problem. Um, but this tremendous amount of money going in right now to cell cultures um, could well shift away, like it could set up the infrastructure, especially if you've, you've sort of set up the governance and you've put a lot of money into to building infrastructure to then say, well, it didn't really work with milk, with meat and milk. And, but, but how about if we start cell culturing uh, fruits or we start cell culturing uh, other things? There's a lot of work right now on hairy root cultures um, to try and uh, do cell cultures that will produce uh, uh, natural products. And, and there's a direct similarity to what actually happened around synthetic biology. And I just would encourage people to look, if we were having this discussion, um, you know, in around 2007, 2008, we would have been talking about how we need to let the synthetic biology industry go because, uh, and, and really take off because they're about to produce endless biofuels. And they were all, all talking about that. This is the answer to climate change. This was about biofuels. Within three or four or five years, that had switched. They realized it wasn't going to happen, but the same technology then shifted to natural products, to producing vanillin or producing um, plastics and, and or not even that, just sort of these cosmetic ingredients, which are high value. And, and my, my intuition is something similar is going to happen here. The, 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 we're talking now about milk and, milk and meat and so forth, because that, that's, a, that's, that's got a lot of hype around it, but it doesn't, it doesn't stack up. But once the, once the governance is in place, once you've put the money in place, it will switch to high value specialized ingredients, um, which will take away from farmers, from growers, from pickers. Um, so we really need to be a little careful about, you know, what's ultimately the long game here. All right. Um, I want to um, shift into talking about, and I think this sort of gets back to this um, underlying debate about markets and innovation and the way that our society operates. Um, because we're in the United States, because we're in the 20th century, this stuff is coming from venture capital um, and, and billionaires. Um, you know, venture capital plus the odd billionaire um, are. Are the, are the folks investing in it, folks like Sergey Brin and, and Bill Gates there for a while, although he um, recently said he didn't think it was gonna work on a large scale. Um, and that is a very particular style and a particular mood, VC. And um, to what extent do, do you folks think that this sort of um, VC fixation, the sort of um, the, the need for this industry to rely on VC, um, is distorting things and is um, is, is making companies, um, you know, is sort of shaping companies' deci uh, decisions and their goals of we got to get a damn product out as soon as possible. We got to get a high end chef who, who will say she'll cook this stuff up. Um, is VC distorting this? And would things be better if we had a different way of funding it? Um, I know Isha's got some things to say about this. Yeah, I. I would love to see a whole bunch of different types of funding in this space. Um, I feel like VC is just is happening. And so we need to think about what other funding needs to be in place so that we can steer the field in a way that we feel most comfortable with and like the most. But I think, you know, VC, the VC phenomenon is not unique to cellular agriculture. It's, it's affecting so many different things right now. And and disrupting so many things. And there's a heavy privatization of a lot of stuff going on right now. And I think we, 
you know, I think a lot of the problems with this field are associated with it just being so private. But again, I don't think that that's necessarily what everyone wants as much as it's just the system and people are falling into it and not challenging it right out of the gate. Um, so I, I don't have actually that much more to add other than we do need some other types of funding in here that are hopefully a lot more public. Jessica? I would echo what Isha says about the importance of public funding. You know, I think particularly on research, it's critically important that there be open access public re research available. Um, our two organizations are currently the biggest funders of research in this space right now. And I think that, you know, there's a really important role for governments to play in, in funding this kind of research. I will note that the National Science Foundation last year um, announced an award to UC Davis to fund some research there. So that's a fantastic start, but on, you know, not at the scale at which it's really needed. Um Unless anyone wants to jump in on that question, I kind of want to shift to a, a, a big picture kind of deal and then finally move over to audience questions. And, um, and so I want to talk a little bit about, and I think J someone in the, in the chat did, did hit Jim with this. Um, uh, so I'll, maybe I'll incorporate that. You know, the, the basic question being, hey man, if this stuff, if this stuff works, if they can't actually get a, a chicken breast to come out of a vat, um, then why the hell are you against it? Um, and so I guess what I wanna hear comments on is um, from the skeptics like Jim, um, if you don't think this is a viable strategy, what is a viable strategy? Um, you know, the United States, we, um, or we, we make enough meat to uh, feed everyone about 220 pounds of meat. Um, and our industry is, is so big and so powerful that they produce even more than that. And they're you know, actively seeking export markets. Um, and it's this sort of whole um, industry based on growth. Um, how do we fight back against that? And for the, um, the enthusiasts on the panel, well, let's talk a little bit about how this doesn't become another situation like we have dicamba waft, wafting around the corn belt um, with, um, with GMOs, or we have you know, low income people struggling to get insulin because um, our healthcare system is such a boondoggle. Um, you know, how, do we, you know, how do we knit this in to um, a, a, a better food system? Uh, so why don't we start with Jim? Um, tell us how you, you would do it if you know, this, um, sell meat stuff is foolish, you know, in, in your view. Um, well, I, I think earlier on we heard Jessica say that she was a realist and um, Aisha say that she was uh, um, an idealist. Um, I'm an activist, um, but I hope I'm also, that's based on realism too. And the reality of the global food system, and, and I'm talking globally, but I think, you know, this is somewhat true in, the, in, in North America too, is uh, to a lesser extent, but certainly globally, is that three quarters of the world is fed by, by peasant agriculture, it's fed by small farmers, it's fed, fed in agroecological production. Um, and, and that's a form of production that largely isn't having an impact on climate, that, that is sort of giving control back to communities. Um, so that's where you start, that's what feeds people. Um, and it's doing, and those systems are doing so on only 20 to 30% of, um, of, of land. So that's where you start. You start to build a food system starting with peasants, starting with small farmers. They have a, a mug here from the FAO that I'm drinking out of. Small farmers feed the world. It's true. That's where you start. You don't start with, uh, with a privately controlled, lab-grown, um, patented technology that's going to be owned by tech bros and billionaires. That makes no sense. You start with the real movements of people who are connected to the earth. So it's not about trying to create a moonshot. It's about creating an earth shot where you're allowing the, 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 the already existing diverse cultures, polycultures. I mean, it's ironic that this technology is called cultured meat. There's almost no culture in it. There's no history. There's no story. There's no, you know, the cultures that are actually built around uh, the growing of food and actually feed people. That's where you start. So that's where we have a global food sovereignty movement that's trying to take back land for small farmers and indigenous peoples. Um, you know, I can, I, we just produced a report called the Long Food Movement that looks 25 years ahead. It looks at agribusiness strategies, including culture 
food needs and why they're a problem. But it also talks about how movements coming together across the food chain um, and working in diverse, difficult, di different ways um, with um, you know local territorial production. That there's there's a movements and movements who are coming up with solutions here, and they're doing it together in solidarity, not not in this kind of single drop in approaches. Well, I I just what what would it take, Jim, for the cell cultured stuff to feel part of those other movements? Like, do you think oh, there is a world straight... where they can be together? It's very straightforward, no? Dishra. It's to listen. It's to listen and to listen to what are the many issues happening across the food system, whether it's the the way in which migrant workers' rights are, are being trampled and and people are being you know, put in prison, frankly, um, whether it's it's looking at um, you know, the issues of poverty and food poverty, and to listen to the um, approaches that are coming up from communities that have always come up from communities and say, you know, does this knowledge, the knowledge that farmers and growers and, that they have, does it fit to this technology? Now, this technology looks like a very rarefied technology that can be only controlled by, by you mm -hmm. know, a few expert companies um, and, and well-financed uh, 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 corporations. If that doesn't fit to a, to, a, to a food system that's democratic and just and involved, then it just doesn't fit. It's, it's terribly nice and it can be a tiny little niche, but should never pretend that it's, it's some answer to saving the planet or creating a socially just world. All right, Isha. Thank you, Jim. You want to go, Isha? No, I was just listening to Jim and forgot to mute myself. <laughs> <laughs> that was a great well, answer. Thank you. Okay, why don't we hit um, Tom in um, and keep it snappy so we can get some, some questions in, please. And you're a mute, I believe. I'm on mute. Um, yeah, I think raising all those questions are the right way. I, you know, for me, I still wanna make sure it's safe. And if everybody's doing it, we have to have a tech, I, I agree, the technology is probably not gonna be widely distributed. It's not gonna be at a small scale simply because it's going to be pretty intensive. I've seen that from my fermentation days, making antibiotics and insulin. So I think those concerns are legit. I always come back to, we have to make sure it's safe. And if a company isn't willing to go through the proper procedures to make sure it's safe and have it screened in a transparent process with public comment and the right to object, you wonder how much the investment it's gonna be in the precedent we set. All right. Jessica, what about you? Um, how do we make this not be another Uber or, That's such a um, great question. or, or Facebook? Um, you know, Facebook was going to revolutionize communication. Now it's, you know, history's greatest monster, according to some people. Mm -hmm. um, total creation of VC. Um, how, how, do we, how do we stop um, lab meat from doing that? Well, I love the vision that Jim is, is putting out for, for us. Um, and I do think that it, if our future holds um, the promise of, of getting to smallholder farmers and folks growing um, meat and other kinds of food on the land that, where they live, then you know that this technology might be obsolete. But the reality is that we live in a system that has industrial meat production. And I find this kind of industrial meat production far superior to, to the status quo. And when I looked feeding a, a 10 billion people by 2050, you know, just as a point of comparison, um, in relation to the techno-economic analysis that I referenced earlier, we did a life cycle analysis, and that found that if this technology uses renewable energy, and it is energy intensive, so, you know, this is kind of the electrify everything, this is electrifying meat. If we use renewable energy, the climate footprint will be 92% less for beef, 52% less for pork, 17% less for chicken, I think, and then it frees up incredible amounts of land, like Isha was talking about. It reduces pollution, it uses less water, you know, the the benefits are multitude. So I think that this can coexist with smallholder farmers and regenerative agriculture. And um, it's scalable in a way that some of the other solutions uh, are not if we're going to continue to eat the amount of meat that we're eating. And it only looks like people worldwide are going to eat more and more. Um, Isha, do you feel like you had a, a chance to, to answer? 
I know you um, intervened <laughs> and pushed Jen. Um, I, I, could you repeat the question one more time? Yeah, I'm not getting so, lost in the answers. Um, I, I know it, this is something that you that you thought about, and and that is, um, you know, this technology. I mean, I think it's coming. It's, um, you know, I, I don't know how how close it is, but people are are working on it. There's hundreds of millions of dollars going into it. Um, and how do we, how do we, st how do we stop it from being yet another sort of VC funded, like, let's say it takes off, let's say, you know, all the scale problems and stuff are solved. How do we, how do we stop it from, you know, not, um, fitting into Jim's, um, paradigm of, you know, sort of working contra to small scale farmers um, and diversified farmers. How do we how do we stop it from being like, um, you know, um, so much so much alternative food ends up being a niche product for the rich. Uh, I, I, re I write about this in my book, like 25 years of activism in the United States, um, this massive growth of, uh, of organics and still most people um, eat industrial food um, and are, are getting sick from it. How, how do we stop it from being a niche product? How do we stop it from being a, um, you know, like like the Tesla is, you know, at, as we speak right now, um, a, a feel good product for, pe for, for people who can afford it and can get access to the tax breaks, et cetera. Um, mm -hmm. Meanwhile, we're burning, you know, this unconscionable amount of fossil fuel to get around. Mm -hmm. um, how do we stop, uh, you know, sell meat from, from doing that? I, so I agree with you, this is happening, whether we like it or not. And so I think that we are in a position of how do we steer it, not how do we stop it? Cause I just don't think stopping is possible. Like we, that's not, that's not where we're, we are right now. And also I don't want to stop it. I do still think that this is a technology that has promise and could be steered in, in a certain direction. And I think there is potential good in Tesla and Uber, but they are all in steering positions too. And maybe they were not steered in the way we liked because it was such a privatized conversation from the beginning. And so I think we're in a very, very important time where I you know, want to echo what Jim was saying about listening. I think we need to see how linked so many issues are right now and how they must work together and how there, there just won't be one solution to everything. And I also don't think agroecology is going to be the one solution to everything, but there is a, problem that we all can agree is animal agriculture, industrialized animal agriculture in its current format. And so I think we need to think, look at our toolbox of what are the things that could sub it out or disrupt it or change it and see how they have to work together in order to make that happen. And I, you know, I think that cellular agriculture can be still ushered in in a way that is really responsible and thoughtful. And I do agree with Jim that that's only possible if we actually unite with other people who are thinking about broader system change, other ways of farming, other ways of, of uh, feeding the world, because I, the future is going to be a diversified one. The best future is going to be a diversified one, not a monopolized one in, in whatever that looks like. Um, here's a question from the audience. Is there any consumer acceptance data available? Um, are we arguing about something that people are gonna um, say, ooh, gross about? Um, what do we know about consumer acceptance? Anyone wanna jump in and take that? I'll jump in. Um, so we have some data from 2019, uh, which showed that we looked at American, Indian, and Chinese consumers. We found in the United States that 30% 30, uh, 30 of people were very or extremely likely to purchase uh, cultivated meat regularly and that more familiarity meant more acceptance. And those numbers were roughly double in China and India. GFI is an international nonprofit. So we work in the United States, but we also work in Asia um, and have folks working in, uh, in India and and um, work with a consultancy in China. So I think that there's, you know, uh, great promise for, for lots of people to enjoy it. If people who are in part of the audience though think it doesn't sound like their thing, there's a whole world of alternative proteins and we're, you know, equally excited about plant-based options and options from fermentation. And I think they all need to be, you know, 
Isha talked about a toolbox. They all need to be part of our toolbox in creating meat that people want to eat in ways that are, uh, you know, um, don't use up the same land and resources that our current production system does. Tom? Yeah, uh, Bill Hallman did a study that was funded by one of the cell cultured companies, the developers of seafood, uh, Blue Nalu. And he did a consumer survey that I think reinforces a lot of what you just said, Jessica, that can, not everybody, but for many people, they're curious about it. They're going to want to taste it. It still has to meet all of the taste and the texture, the nutrition ones. But if, you, if that hurdle, which is a high hurdle, can be cleared, it looked like people were open to it. I think people see that, that the current approach isn't going to be sustainable. We can't feed the world. We don't have enough protein to do it. We need an all of the above option. And if people are interested in it, let's give a choice. I don't want to be the, the food police out there and telling people what to eat. Jim? I'm, I'm concerned about all of the above as an approach. The last time we had all of above policy, it was around, uh, it was the Obama administration talking about, we need an all of the above policy on energy and climate. And that meant we're gonna move ahead with fracking. We're gonna move ahead with biofuels. We're gonna move ahead with biomass. Um, each one of those, we could have seen if we'd done a basic technology assessment, there were some real problems. Um, and so, you know, it took movements to try and stop the fracking, to try and stop the, the sort of ethanol boondoggle and the impact it had on, on food and hunger. Um, and, and now we're having a, well, we'll just let a thousand, a thousand uh, flowers bloom and we'll have an all of the above approach. We, we can't. This food system that we have is, is very messed up for sure, um, but it's, it's what feeds us. It's, it's important that the 800 million people or the billions of people who are, um, who are food insecure and don't have control of their food are able to regain control. And we can't just let everything run all along one side. We have to make choices. That's why we have politics. That's why we have governments. And, and in this case, it means having some real technology assessment of public participation um, and thinking through these things rather than being sort of railroaded into it by a few VCs who want to set the, uh, the policy environment quickly before anyone's talked about it. Um. So Michelle Simon has a question um, and Jim Marty introduced her um, and she says, she's pointing to this, this study that I just put in the chat um, by a researcher named David Humberg. And I think it's correct that he got par partial funding from Good Food Institute maybe. Um, no, I think from the Open Philanthropy Project. That's right. Yes, that's what it is. Thank you so much for that correction, which funds a good food institute. Um, but so this is a, a outfit that's friendly to the idea of cell based meat. And I talked to, to David for my article and he's an engineer um, and analyzed the sort of systems. And he basically came to the conclusion from looking at a lot of the data out there and studies and trying to figure out what, the, what these private companies are up to, that the main technical challenges, technological challenges of lab-based meat remain. Um, it's still really hard to get um, a, a, a inexpensive serum. It's um, still extremely hard to go, um, you know, Thomas said you can scale, uh, Tom, I'm sorry, I said you could scale this stuff pretty easily. Um, I, I don't think that is what people are finding. You know, when I talked to Just Food about their, um, their, their product in Singapore, they said, oh yeah, you know, it'll take us three to six years to, to scale it up. And that kind of horizon keeps um, moving back. Um, what do you say about this Humbird study? And I, I know that uh, Good Food has a study saying that it's gonna be um, competitive by 2030, which is uh, coming up here pretty quick. Um, what do y'all say to the, to, to the Humbird study, those who have, are, are familiar with it? Jessica, have you been able to read it? So I have shared all the information. I, again, policy is my lane and not technological readiness. But you know, just to reiterate, we do have this independent study that we commissioned that found that uh, it would be cost comparative by 2030. You know, we talked about that bringing the cost of the cell culture media down, which is currently the biggest kind of 
hurdle to cost competitiveness. Um, and we have this new snapshot that's available on our website, as well as this analysis by our, our Vice President of Science and Technology that shows that the, those prices can come down. Um, you know, when we started, the Good Food Institute was not attached to any particular technology platform. We wanted to use technology and markets to address Address what we saw as a looming protein crisis for our world. And um, we were, I think, pleasantly surprised when the scientists we brought on board were as bullish about cultivated meat as they were around plant-based meat. I think that defied some people's expectations. You know, in some ways it's it's even harder to biomimic meat from plants as opposed to using cells and growing them in a, in a cultivator. So um, you know, if this technology doesn't end up being uh, viable. I think we have these other two technology platforms that we're really excited about, you know, fermentation and plant-based um, meat. But right now, I know that my colleagues who do know the science and have worked in, you know, kind of um, these fields and cell culturing and things disagree with the, the underlying or the conclusion of this study. And beyond that, I think you have to ask me more about Congress or FDA because that's more where I'm comfortable talking. <laughs> I hear you. Anyone else want to jump in on that one? Yes, please, Isha. Yes, um, I think for me, the uh, tech readiness ass assessments and the consumer acceptance things are kind of the same, like they're just different speculations of what might happen. But I think they all need to be taken with a grain of salt because there isn't a lot of transparency in terms of what technologies we should be evaluating in particular. We don't know exactly what the the companies are working on. So there's just a lot of guesswork in it. And there's also a lot of research that just has yet to, to emerge. And so, um, you know, I see, I see some saying it's ready. I say some that's not, you know, I, I still think there's a lot of open questions to be answered before we can really say anything with confidence. Um, again, another reason why we need more kind of public academic research in this space. Okay, well, we have a, um, a big question here. We have a scenario um, being laid out in the chat. Um, and it goes a little something like this. What if there was a government financed land bank? And this is sort of speaking my language. Um, I think um, land and land ownership is a, is a huge question. Consolidation of land ownership in the United States. Um, speaking of markets, the way that um, that has been handled, I think, is um, a pretty big disaster. So what if we had a, a land bank that purchased a fraction of 800 million acres currently dedicated to feeding animals in the United States? So all of the corn and soybeans and um, hay crops, and it could resell land on favorable terms for bold new uses. Who wrote this? Me? Um, I think this is a great idea. Um, and, you know, basically, uh, I think what is being, I think the, the, um, the core of the question here is what if land, some kind of fair land reform came to the United States and we could figure out um, um, new uses for this land. And I think this is one of the, the, the questions I, I still have for you, Jim. And that is that this system has so much momentum and the Corn Belt has already surrendered 35% of its topsoil that momentum is pushing forward um, faster than, than cell-based meat, I can tell you that. Uh, I'm more confident that the Midwest will destroy its topsoil in the next 10 years than I am in the idea that cell-based meat will be commercially viable in 10, base, in, in 10, in 10 years. Um, how, you know, how do we deal with that and how do we get a social movement that could create uh, an actual push for land reform in the United States. And um, we're running really short on time. So you got three minutes um, max to- um, um, your, your book, Perilous Bounty, was one of the most depressing books and brilliant books I've ever read. And it dealt with exactly this question. Um, and, and of course, this is exactly the kind of thorny questions that we have to work together through as movements. And we have to do it with the complexity of place, with the background of story and history, um, and not from the idea that by just creating a few cells in a lab, we're going to somehow solve everything. So, uh, you know, I, nobody's going to answer that question quickly because it's too big and complex and thorny a problem. But it starts with political answers, not with technical answers. 
Um, and I think that's, you know, that's, that speaks to what we're doing here. It's, it's a distraction to try and come up with a techno fix to the many problems we have um, and to be trying to roll. It's a, it's a waste of political energy to try and enable that. Okay, last words going once, two minutes. Anyone, Jessica, Tom, Isha, anyone want to jump in? I guess I just Take invite people who are really interested in this topic to come to our conference. We're going to have just get into all sorts of detail on this. So if folks are interested, it's the Good Food Conference. It's coming up in a couple of weeks. And I appreciate the opportunity to have this conversation with you all and to um, explore these issues with folks who see things a little bit differently than I do. I think this is a fantastic forum and I'm really grateful to the Consumer Federation of America for hosting us and Tom for you to, for moderating us. So thank you. Thank you, Isha. Um, I, I love your point about the Corn Belt moving upwards. Uh, I also wanted to point out that African swine fever is one of the biggest underreported phenomena, like I don't want to call it phenomenon, but disasters that is happening to earthlings today, where since 2018, an estimated one in four pigs has been infected by a fever with 100% mortality rate. And so that's just all to point out that Animal agriculture is on shifting sands already, and it is being disrupted, not by me or anyone else on this panel, but by just what has happened from animal agriculture scaling at the scale that it exists today. And so we really need to be thinking about what toolbox we need to put together to be ready for that transition afterwards, because losing 350 million pigs, um, you know, it, it's nice to know that I guess animal agriculture is being disrupted, but that that's a lot of mouths not fed. That's a lot of farmers not being paid. That is a huge disruption with a lot of disaster behind it too. And so we need to be very proactive about uh, the fact that we are on shifting sands. We can't just project technology into the status quo world as we know it, because there is no world as we know it anymore. Wonderful. Me, Tom, thanks to Thomas, 30 CFA, seconds. and Tom for making this happen. It was a good discussion. I appreciate it. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. And Thanks, thanks to, uh, to all of you for that great panel. Uh, Tom Philpott, Jessica Alme, Isha Dattar, Tom Meltner, and Jim Thomas. And thanks to all of our audience members for listening and asking great questions. Love the level of engagement on this, on this panel. Uh, and we hope, hope to see all of you again on October 5th and 6th for our 44th, not 43rd, but 44th annual National Food Policy Conference which again this year will sadly be held virtually, but it's gonna be great. And registration is open and you got a link in the chat box and we would love to see you again. And until then, stay well and enjoy the rest of your Tuesday. Thank you. Wonderful, thank you. Thank you so much, everyone.